Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and I have a big congratulations to Firefly Aerospace, who managed to get Firefly Alpha launch number two into orbit and demonstrate their vehicle. This is my view from 250 miles away, and it was apparently so powerful that Twitter suspended my account over posting it. The launch was from Vandenberg Space Force Base, Space Launch Complex 2, which had formerly played host to the Delta 2. It was a whole lot simpler from when I visited there for the last Delta launch back in 2018. Firefly Alpha is a much smaller, horizontally integrated rocket, unlike the Delta 2. Although, you know, historically, well, the Delta 2 was the Thor, and the Firefly Alpha is actually pretty close in terms of size to the Thor. And it's just got a whole lot of modern technology and capabilities. So for the live coverage on the internet, uh, Firefly handed off its footage directly to Tim Dodd, everyday astronaut, who was on hand using his space van, taking all the official feed and trying to, you know, coordinate it for everyone. He did a fantastic job, although I, you know, had to correct him a couple of times, but that's okay. We still all love you. Uh, there was one failure on Thursday night. This is Michael Baylor's footage showing it, it happen. He actually publishes this at one quarter normal speed and it looks fantastic. Go and check it out. 24 hours later, they reset and the countdown went all the way to zero. Vehicle lit its engines and it, well, I don't know what happened to the video feed at this point. <laughs> but, you know, it did actually launch. Vandenberg was basically completely socked in with a marine layer. Thankfully, the Vandenberg, they have cameras that are on the hills that were apparently above this and were able to see through a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the haze using infrared. So, you know, there's a real, like, tragic irony that uh, Tim went all the way out for this multiple times, right? They, uh, he, they actually tried to launch a couple of weeks ago and failed, and then he had to go away and come back. And then they scrubbed yesterday, and then when they did finally launch, he couldn't see it because the, the clouds were just too much for him. At 250 miles to the north, I was looking through nice, clear air. Well, it, was, it must have been relatively hazy because the plume was really really red but yeah i could see it all and pick it out using my uh you know nikon camera with this big long lens this was great to see in this first launch but obviously it pales in comparison to the footage that tim was able to later pull from his cameras on site and i'm sure he's going to do like an awesome 4k monster you know production of this I like the way you can even see the particles of the haze at Vandenberg being illuminated by this uh, monstrously bright rocket flame. Anyway, for this flight, the rocket was actually in a somewhat retrograde orbit because they wanted to head it westwards as quickly as possible so it would clear into the ocean. The cameras from the base continued to track it. The Firefly rocket has four Reaver engines in the first stage. Those are kerosene liquid oxygen using the combustion tap-off cycle. That's a way that they eliminate the gas generator and simplify the engine. All four of those engines generate about 75 tons of thrust. The vehicle is about 55 tons of uh, mass. And it's mostly carbon fiber composite. There's no like liner on the tanks or anything. So yeah, stage separation happened about 2 minutes 40 into flight. And watch very carefully. You'll see, first of all, a few particles fly off, but that second stage immediately goes side on. Uh, it's like, must be forced into that by the aerodynamics because it actually looks stable. It's not spinning because of some, uh, you know, thrust that's left over. We also got an onboard camera view since it's heading westwards. That's looking back to Los Angeles on the right side there and the central coast is off to the left. There's obviously not nearly as much lights up there. So that lightning engine generates about seven tons of thrust. Again, it's kerosene liquid oxygen, and that's enough to, of course, put the payload into orbit. It also has relight capabilities, which they demonstrated in this mission. Uh, we got some footage, just pictures from inside the fairing there. They were clearly still low enough that the fairing <laughs> had to be kept. But there, uh, yeah, we got to see the fairing actually come off and get tracked as two separate little objects. So while this rocket does have the ability to put, I believe, about a ton into orbit, which puts it in an interesting position as being bigger than most of the small launchers, uh, but smaller than the big launchers. Okay, that's a completely pointless thing that I just said. Point is, uh, they only had about, you know, I think it was like 37 kilograms worth of payload, including the payload dispensers. These were people that basically volunteered to put their payloads on a, you know, on a rocket for a cut price and or free flight. 
Uh, they did want to demonstrate second stage relight and that worked successfully. Although after the engine shuts down, it put the vehicle into a, a sort of steady rotation, um, which, you know, the, obviously they had to have attitude control capability. And then I think they just turned it off at this point because it didn't matter. But we do get to look down on the earth from that engine camera and see some fantastic views. I think this would be over Africa. Uh, pay no attention to the time of flight at this point because they had to replay it due to, uh, you know, stream problems. But again, from this angle, we get to see a couple of the payload dispensers there. So these aren't the satellites themselves. These are the things that will actually shoot the satellite out so that it you know, separates cleanly from the rocket and gets you know, enough space. Beautiful sun-in-orbit moment. Obviously, the idea is that now that they've demonstrated their capabilities to successfully reach orbit, their customers will actually trust them in putting larger payloads on top of that payload adapter. But for now, these they just have these comically small CubeSats attached to this rocket, which is able to put, you know, 30 times as much mass into orbit. So look, this is great news for Firefly. It's great news for their investors. Except for Max Pelyakov, who was forced to sell his, you know, chunk of stock at a bargain basement price because of security issues, because he was Ukrainian, and I think the U.S. intelligence services might have been, you know, worried that you know Russian army armed forces would just roll through Ukraine in a couple of days, and suddenly there would be all sorts of technological knowledge getting leaked from this collaboration. Anyway, if you watch carefully in the middle, you'll see the one of the satellites getting deployed forwards on its mission to do whatever it was supposed to do. I don't know which satellite switch, to be honest. I do know that these satellites, while small, will join a club or a very exclusive club of highly retrograde satellites that are basically orbiting the Earth in a, basically the wrong direction. Presumably, now that Firefly have demonstrated their launch vehicle, they will be able to perform future launches out, you know, in the correct direction, taking advantage of the rotation of the Earth and lofting larger and heavier payloads with their new shiny launch vehicle that has been, it's, it's got NASA approval, Firefly's engines are going to be working for the Antares rocket. Firefly are really one of these companies that's, uh, you know, sort of, been around for a long time. I mean, they died and then they came back. And finally, they're sort of hitting this level of success where they're involved in all sorts of parts of the industry. And I, I hope they have a hugely successful launch career going forwards. And I hope that Twitter unbans my account at some point. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.